Today, as we begin in this book of Jonah, I realize that some of us probably kind of have a veggies, veggie tales uh, view of Jonah, Jonah and the whale. Uh, others maybe even think that story that you've heard maybe as a child or maybe at church is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, a guy gets swallowed by a whale and then somehow miraculously, miraculously gets vomited out of the whale and come on. But I'm going to step right out here very seriously and tell you this. How you respond to this story may very well determine how you respond to the rest of the Bible. Do you believe it? See, if you, ex if you accept the existence of God and the, and the resurrection of Jesus, which is a far greater miracle, then, then there's really nothing difficult, I think, about reading and believing the book of Jonah, literally. And this short book, I'm telling you, is chock full of valuable lessons for us. But there's one primary theme that we're really going to drill into today in the next couple of weeks. And that is true, love-filled, godly compassion. True, love-filled, godly compassion. We need that. We need the Holy Spirit to cultivate in us compassion. See, I think generally speaking, you saw it on the, the, the video bumper a moment ago. Compassion is not our default position. It's just not. Generally speaking, it's not. Especially towards those outside of our tribe or those outside of our group or outside of our race or outside of our political party. Compassion towards them. Outside of our economic class or even outside of our church. We just generally don't have a lot of love or compassion for all people. Maybe you do. But I think we tend to not. We tend to not, and as the, as the world and culture continues to become more polarized, am I right? And we're seeing it even more so, of course, in this election year, but the temptation and the natural tendency is for us to kind of circle the wagons and retreat back into our most comfortable circle of friends and relationships. I'm talking about those who look like us, those who sound like us, those who act like us, and those who think like us. And those are the people that are right. Y'all are going to be quiet on me this morning, so I'll stir you up a little bit. And as many people increasingly give their lives or, or live their lives online and, so, and on social media, the capacity for empathy actually diminishes. So the driving question of the series is, as followers of Jesus, how do we cultivate compassion? Jonah was a prophet. And a prophet's role was simply to receive God's word and say it. Somebody say, receive it and say it. Hear it and say it. Hear it. See it. Say it. You don't have to like it. He didn't need others to like it. The prophet just needed to hear it and say it. And in Jonah's case, do it. We are not unlike the prophets. We are to hear it. And say it. We are to hear it and do it. So let's jump in. We're starting right here at the beginning of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now there's a lot to unpack here in these opening verses. Let's start with Jonah and his call. So the word of the Lord, so the word of the Lord called Jonah. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, which is a pretty typical way that the accounts of the biblical prophets would go. But by verse two, the original readers would have realized that this prophetic account is unlike any that they had heard before. Jonah's call is to go to Nineveh, go to that great city and call out against it. Now this is surprising on a couple of levels. Let me give you some context here. First, Typically, Israel's prophets would usually be given a word of the Lord to the people of Israel and not to the Gentile pagan nations. Second, and even more shockingly, is that God would even want to warn Nineveh of impending doom. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure some of this shock factor probably gets lost on us a little bit, but here's a little insight. 
Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, one of the most cruelest, one of the most violent empires of ancient times. Their kings would often gloat of entire plains being littered with corpses and of cities being burned to the ground. And if that's not enough, the emperor of that time was known for depicting torture, even dismembering his enemies in gory details. And he would do it on top of the stone walls that surrounded the cities for all to witness. There's a reason for that. Don't mess with us. And specifically for all the enemies to see what happened if they got a hold of them. And these are the people that God sends Jonah to preach to. So let's give Jonah a little bit of a break because we're not going to give him much. So for Jonah and those who would have heard this story, they would have been totally beside themselves wrestling with this question, Wes, wrestling with this word of the Lord that was given to Jonah. How, how could a good God show mercy and compassion to these terribly evil and wicked people? And for those who are of us who are very black and white in our thinking, lean in because this might be for you too. Yet we have the same questions, I think. Think, think of the wickedness in the earth today. Think of those who treat others badly, often very badly. We don't have to think back too far to 9-11 and think of the 9-11 terrorist. We don't have to think very, back very far at all to think of Hamas and Iran's proxies and their hatred and brutality towards Israel and all things good. We know that there are enemies of America that would like to see America destroyed. Or you could just think of your worst enemy. What if God called you to show compassion and show love to that person or these people? Listen, that is exactly the tension that God wants us to wrestle with, and that was exactly what Jonah was feeling. Are you with me? Do we have the context a little bit? For Jonah. So how does Jonah respond to this call? Chapter 1, verse 3 says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Notice this. He rose to flee to Tarshish, not to Nineveh, not to go to Nineveh, but he who would flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He had to get on a ship to get to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Didn't remind us once that it was away from the presence of the Lord, but twice, don't want you to miss this, he's rebelling against the word of the Lord and he's running away from the presence of the Lord. When we go against God, we're going against the presence of the Lord. There is nothing you should want more in your life than the presence of the Lord. We need the presence of the Lord. We don't get the presence of the Lord by running away from God. We get the presence of the Lord by running to God, according to his will and according to his purposes. He ran away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah did the exact opposite of God's call in every way. Let's look at Jonah's rebellion. Remember, God had told Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. And he went to Tarshish. Tarshish was literally in the opposite direction. The opposite direction of Nineveh. It, it's kind of like God saying, David, Cindy, I want you to go to Dougsville, the Atlanta area, and plant a church. And we're like, okay, we're going to Albuquerque. <laughs> okay, opposite direction. We are not doing that. We, it makes all kinds of sense not to do that. Jonah did the exact opposite of God's call in every way. Yet he just, had, he, he just had one job. Arise, go to Nineveh, and call out against them. Why did, why did Jonah abruptly reject and avoid the call? What was it? Was it fear? It, it likely was fear. Was it something else? A lack of belief? Well, we have to assume that on some level, the mission didn't make sense to him at all. Not practically, certainly not theologically. God descri describes Nineveh as a great city. Nineveh was very advanced. It was both a military and a cultural powerhouse. And again, Nineveh was very wicked. 
Why would a place like that even listen to a prophet of God? Why would they even listen to a prophet like Jonah? To put it in terms that maybe we better understand, it, may, it might be like a Jewish rabbi standing in the streets of Berlin in 1941 calling Nazi Germany to repent. How do you think that would have gone? So maybe in the most practical of terms, in Jonah's mind, there's a 0% chance of success for this mission at best and a very high percentage chance that I would be brutally murdered at worst. So God, I'm not going there, makes no sense. I preached a message many years ago entitled, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And how many of you have had that nudging or that word of the Lord, that still small voice come to you and you're saying, God, this doesn't make sense. And he didn't ask us to make sense of it. He asked us to obey him and follow him. Here's what we've got to know. Sometimes God doesn't make sense to our own thinking. So Jonah has a problem. He has a problem with the one job that God gave him. And what's more is that Jonah has even a bigger problem now with God. And at this point, it's easy to cross our arms in judgment, right? Towards Jonah. But I think we all do the same thing at times. I've had many situations through the years when I felt God was calling or leading me, even giving confirmations through others. But yet, rather than running towards God, I'm like, God, are you sure? I don't know. I don't think so. And yet, as I continued to pursue God, faith would rise up and I'd go with God. It's easy for us to begin to worry and even despair when the, when the work dries up or the economy takes a dive and we're, we're, we're just wondering, God, what are you thinking? What are you doing here? This makes no sense. You brought us here and then this happens? Or when we experience betrayal at the deepest levels, we think if there's a God, he obviously doesn't know what he's doing I know you've never been there, or maybe you have. It's in these moments where our faith and our belief system are shaken, I think. And it's in these moments where we absolutely must decide, does God really know what's best, or do I know what's best? We've got to decide that. We've got to decide in faith, God, am I going to trust you, or am I going to trust my own understanding? So Jonah does what? He rejects God's call and he runs. Run, Forrest. I mean, run, Jonah, run. Run. And he ran as far and as fast as he could. Now, there, how many of you know there's more than one way to run from God? Most people are familiar with the story of the prodigal son. Throwing off the constraints of religion and loving, a loving family. Why? Just go do what he wanted to do. To go spend his money on wild living. To go have a good time. To go live life the way I want it because I deserve it. The prodigal son. Maybe some of you have done that. Just running. Then there's those who actually run by their rule keeping. And their own self-righteousness. That's also running away from God. And then there are others who, like Jonah, don't believe that God is good enough or that God is strong enough or that God cares enough to take care of me if I run to God. I run according to his will. Do we believe God is enough in those times? So Jonah runs away from God, and look what happens next. Verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners, the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God, little G God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had got down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. Really? So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God, would, the God would give a thought to us that, that maybe we would not perish. Let's talk about Jonah and his consequence. The author describes Nineveh as that great city, right? And he describes the wind, the storm they were in, a great wind. 
It's the same word in Hebrew. The implicit message here, I think, is this. If Jonah won't go into the great city, he will go into a great storm. For us, I think that means our act of disobedience towards God has a storm attached to it. Now, that's heavy. And that's about as heavy as we're going today, but that's heavy. Our act of disobedience towards God has a storm attached to it. And, I, and we do need to be careful here when I say that because the Bible doesn't say that every, difficult, every difficulty in our life is the result of sin. It doesn't. But it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, destruction. But it doesn't have to have you continue into difficulty if there's true repentance. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for Jesus. He said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There, there can be a turning around, a complete 180 from running away from God and running to God through repentance. Timothy Keller says it this way. He says, if we violate the design and purpose of things, if we sin against our bodies, against our relationships or society, they strike back. What do I mean? It's the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. I think that's what Keller is saying here. And listen, that works for a lot of things besides just money. The Bible also teaches that for Christians, storms can wake us up through the truth that we might not otherwise see. I know I, I, I could have you lift your hand on this one. How many of you know you've been through some storms and you learned something in those storms? You learn something about faith in those storms. You learn something about a good God in those storms. You learn that maybe you weren't in the place you should have been, and so you make a move to get into the place you needed to be because you didn't want to stay in that storm. Storms can help develop our faith. It will. God will allow us to walk right into that storm to develop our faith, to develop our love, to develop our patience, to develop our humility, to develop our self-control, to draw us closer to him. A lot of times storms can do that like nothing else can. Every storm has the potential to soften your heart towards God or to harden your heart towards God. I've seen both. Sadly, Jonah seemed oblivious. He seemed indifferent to even the possibility that God was at work here. His heart seemed to be hardening the further, the faster that he ran. It just does. The heart gets harder the further you walk. You don't even have to be running, but if you're just walking away, away from the presence of God, away from the goodness of God, away from God himself, the heart gets harder and harder and harder. And the scripture shows us that Jonah was not acting like a man of God around the pagan sailors on board. We, we can learn so much from this. Two times, Jonah finds himself in close proximity with people in this passage, people who are racially and religiously different than him. And in both cases, his behavior is dismissive and unhelpful. We would probably say it was unlike Christ. In fact, in both cases, the pagans are acting more like God than God's prophet is acting like God. And this is one of the main themes of the book of Jonah, that God is compassionate. And God cares how we, his people, relate and have compassion for people. He cares how we care. He cares if we love. We care, he cares if we love like his son Jesus loved people. Not people like him, but people unlike him. People that didn't like him. He loved people. God cares that we have compassion for all people, especially those who are different from us. Now, who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about people that are different than us. I mean, all kinds of things can come in your mind, but let's just start here in this room. I'm doing a 360 or at least I'm looking around, nobody here, but I'm looking around. I'm, see, I'm seeing a lot of people different than me. You're seeing a lot of people, go ahead and turn your head and look around at the beautiful people around you. Beautiful people around you that are very, very different than you. And yet God loves us 
enough to call us to love them, to love him, to love her. No matter what they have walked through, no matter what their background is, no matter what theological camp they've been in or are, or what political camp they are, I'm supposed to love them. I can't stand what they stand for. Can you love them? Oh, boy, here we go. Or for those who have no preference at all, or for those who don't have any theology at all about them, do we have compassion for them? Do we have compassion for those people who hate what I love? I want to be like Jesus. Make me more like you. Make me more like you. Give me a heart that's filled with love. Make me more like you. That's a great song. But can you pray it with integrity of heart? Lord, make me more like you. Make me more like you. Give me a heart that's filled with love and make me more like you, Jesus. We can't under, underestimate here or understate Jonah's lack of compassion here. Jonah, he is failing the test with flying colors. Verse 9. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. What's more is that in the last few verses we read, and you can't hardly miss the contrast between the pagan sailors and the prophet of Israel. And it's not good. There's quite a contrast. Jonah seems to be completely out of touch with the kind of trouble that they're in right there. What's he do? He goes down to bed. He goes to sleep. They're up dealing with the storm, all the problems being caused because of Jonah. He goes down to take a nap. He doesn't seem to care. The others care. He's absorbed with his own issues while the pagan sailors are seeking the common good of everyone in the boat. They're dealing with the problem at hand. They're dealing with the storm and what's happening with the ship and the people. The sailors each pray to their own God, it said. Little G God, yes, but they're praying to their own God. But interestingly, Jonah is not praying to his. The sailors seem to have spiritual discernment. They have spiritual discernment that this is unlike any storm that they'd ever been in. And, and they discern it to be on account of someone who has sinned against God or one of their gods or they have some discernment about them. Jonah seems to be clueless. And the sailors are not narrow-minded and bigoted. They're even open to calling on Jonah's God. Whatever it takes to get us out of this storm. In fact, they seem to be more eager to call on Jonah's God than Jonah is. So when the captain of the ship goes down to find Jonah... What's he find here? He finds him sleeping. Look what he says in verse 6. Arise, call out to your God. Arise, call. The same words that he heard from God. Arise, go to Nineveh, call out against Nineveh. And notice that God sent Jonah to point the pagans to God, but now it's the pagans pointing Jonah to God. Jonah, call out to your God. What a twist of events. The pagans and the prophet. Even the prophets can run away from God. And at this time, what's happening with Jonah? His heart is hardening. His heart is hardening. And that's what running from God does. I can't emphasize that enough. Jonah's private faith now has no public good. Because he's running from God. He just seems lost. Listen, the world will not see a God of mercy and compassion if we find ourselves running from God. In this polarized society we live in today, there is one hope. It is the people of God who know their God, who will love like God loves and will reach back across the chasm and say, I see you, I love you, I care about you. Let's come together. Even though we might see the landscape of things differently, I see you, I love you. I want to get to know you. Why? Because that's the heart of God. 
That's what we need. For Jonah, I mean, it's, it's, he's not doing that. In fact, it's just a bad situation getting worse. The storm intensifies, and verse 11 says, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? They recognize he's the problem. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. I mean, your heart's got to be pretty hard at that point. You're not crying out to God. You're saying, kill me. I mean, that, that's the place of depression he is in with his hardening heart. Throw me into the sea and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, capital L Lord, O oh Lord God, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. God answered the pagan's prayer. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. More about that next week. <laughs> I wanna to talk to those today that are running. You're running. You're running from God. You're running from God's presence. You do enough to put your toe in the water to get a little feel-good moment, but you're running. And you're wondering why the great wind or the wind has become great and the storm is continuing to blow and you're now even pointing a finger at God rather than worshiping God. Because you don't like the place you're in, you don't like the storm that you're in, and yet the Holy Spirit is letting you know today it's because you're still running and your heart's getting harder. I need prayer people praying with me right now because God's dealing with some hearts right now because he's calling you to a place, a place, a good place, but it might be a place where yes, there's some fear involved and it's gonna require faith. It doesn't seem to make sense and God's been calling you, but because it didn't make sense, you decided, you're going to run the other way. But God's saying, no, my presence is here. My presence goes with you when you respond to what I'm calling you to. And the very first place that God calls us to is a relationship with his son, Jesus. And yes, some of you have been dodging that all you can. Well, you can't dodge it anymore. Today's the day for you to look face to face and say, God, I'm with you. I'm for you. I want to follow you. I, I, I repent of my running. I repent of my disobedience. I repent of my rebellion. Listen, until you repent and turn, it's not going to get better. The storm's going to get greater. It's just the way it is. It's the way the Bible teaches. It's the way we've been. We've seen it all throughout scripture, but also we've seen it in people's lives. I've been walking with people for a long time. It's just that way. The harder the heart, the heart gets, the bigger the storms get. You say, well, I've got a pretty hard heart. My storm's not too bad. Yet, I'm not trying to scare you into this. I'm trying to tell you truthfully, God loves you and he wants you to follow him and he wants to take you to a large place where he will use you for his glory and praise. Bow your heads with me right now. If you're here today and pastor, you say, I know you're talking to me. I may not be running, but I've been walking away. I know my heart's gotten hard and harder. And today I want to return to Jesus. I want him to make my heart right with God. He'll do that in a moment. If with your heart of repentance, you'll turn. Repentance is 180. It's saying I'm turning from where I've been heading and I'm turning to God. I'm not going to run from him. I'm going to run towards him. I'm going to run towards him. Let me just say this. He's running towards you right now. With this message and this moment, he's running towards you right now. And he's saying, I love you. And I want you to have my love for, for others. I want you to run to me. 
if that's you today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus and run to him on the count of three. Just slip up your hand. We're going to pray and God's going to do a work. One, two, three. All over this room. Just slip up your hand. Hands are going up. Yes. Yes. God bless you. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I see your hands in the back. Yes. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. I want everyone to pray a simple but a powerful, powerful faith-filled prayer. And then we're going to have prayer partners come in a moment. And I'm going to invite you to come and share with them. But I, I just want you right now to just pray with me out loud. If you would, just, just pray this simple prayer. Everybody join with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we run to you. We run to you right now. Forgive me for my disobedience. Forgive me of all sin. I ask you to cleanse me and wash me. Make me brand new on the inside and give me a heart for you. Give me faith to believe you, to trust you enough that in all things, I will follow you. I'm not gonna try to make sense of it. I'm gonna put my faith in you. I'm gonna put my hope completely in you. God, I thank you for doing a new thing. Do a new thing in me right now. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead and you're doing a new thing in my life right now. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for making me right with God. Now help me to walk with God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. How many of you lift up your hand real quick and say, Pastor Dave, I just need great, I need compassion. I need a dose of God's love and a dose of God's compassion to infuse my heart right now. How many of you would agree with me right now? Listen, listen, I'm gonna be real transparent with you. One of the things I struggle with sometimes is, is having love and compassion for people that don't think like I do. Oh, I know I'm the only one here that like that, but I'm telling you, God wants to give us a love and a compassion for all people. Slip up your hand and let's just ask him for that right now. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would just pour out your love, great love and compassion on our hearts for others. Others that don't look like us, sound like us, act like us, think like us. God, give us love for people. Help us to be intentional to show that love to them. In Jesus' name, come on, stand up on your feet right now and give the Lord praise because he's doing a work in our hearts today. We need it, Jesus. We need it, Jesus. It's running.